Book Three, Chapter One, of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Three, Houghton Tower. Chapter One, Downham Manor House. On a lovely morning, about the middle of July, in the same year as the events previously narrated, Nicholas Asherton, always astir with the lark, issued from his dwelling, and sauntered across the smooth lawn in front of it. The green eminence on which he stood was sheltered on the right by a grove of sycamores, forming the boundary of the park, and sloped down to a valley threaded by a small clear stream, whose murmuring, as it danced over its pebbly bed, distinctly reached his ear in the stillness of early day. On the left, partly in the valley and partly on the side of the acclivity on which the hall was situated, nestled the little village whose inhabitants owned Nicholas as lord, and to judge from their habitations they had reason to rejoice in their master, for certainly there was a cheerful air about Downham, which the neighbouring hamlets, especially those in Pendle Forest, sadly wanted. On the left of the mansion, and only separated from it by the garden walls, stood the church, a venerable structure dating back to a period more remote even than Whaley Abbey. From the churchyard a view, almost similar to that enjoyed by the squire, was obtained, though partially interrupted by the thick rounded foliage of a large tree growing beneath it, and many a traveller who came that way lingered within the hallowed precincts to contemplate the prospect. At the foot of the hill was a small stone bridge crossing the stream. Across the road, and scarce thirty paces from the church gate, stood a little alehouse, whose comfortable fireside nook and good liquors were not disdained by the squire. In fact, to his shame, be it spoken, he was quite as often to be found there of an evening as at the hall. This had more particularly been the case since the house was tenanted by Richard Baldwin, who, having given up the mill at Rough Lee, and taken to wife Bess Whittaker of Goldshaw Booth, had removed with her to Downham, where he now flourished under the special protection of the squire. Bess had lost none of her old habits of command, and it must be confessed that poor Richard played a very secondary part in the establishment. Nicholas, as may be supposed, was permitted considerable licence by her, but even he had limits, which she took good care he should not exceed. The Downham domains were well cultivated, the line of demarcation between them and the heathy wastes adjoining being clearly traced out, and you had only to follow the course of the brook to see at a glance where the purlieus of the forest ended, and where Nicholas Asherton's property commenced, the one being a dreary moor, with here and there a thicket upon it, but more frequently a dangerous morass covered with sulphur-coloured moss, and the other consisting of green meadows, bordered in most instances by magnificent timber. The contrast, however, was not without its charm, and while the sterile wastes set off the fair and fertile fields around them, and enhanced their beauty, they offered a wide, uninterrupted expanse, over which the eye could range at will. On the further side of the valley, and immediately opposite the lawn whereupon Nicholas stood, the ground gradually arose until it reached the foot of Pendle Hill, which here, assuming its most majestic aspect, constituted the grand and peculiar feature of the scene. Nowhere could the lordly eminence be seen to the same advantage as from this point, and Nicholas contemplated it with feelings of rapture, which no familiarity could diminish. The sun shone brightly upon its rounded summit, and upon its seamy sides, revealing all its rifts and ridges, adding depth of tint to its dusky soil, laid bare in places by the winter torrents, lending new beauty to its purple heath, and making its grey sod glow as with fire. So exhilarating was the prospect, that Nicholas felt half tempted to cross the valley and scale the hill before breaking his fast, but other feelings checked him, and he turned towards the right. Here, beyond a paddock and some outbuildings, lay the park, small in extent, but beautifully diversified, well stocked with deer, and boasting much noble timber. In the midst was an exquisite knoll, which, beside commanding a fine view of Pendle Hill, Downham, and all the adjacent country, 
brought within its scope, on the one hand, the ancient castle of Clitheroe and the heights overlooking Whaley, and on the other, the lovely and extensive vale through which the Ribble wandered. This also was a favourite point of view with the squire, and he had some idea of walking towards it, when he was arrested by a person who came from the house, and who shouted to him, hoarsely but blithely, to stay. The newcomer was a man of middle age, with a skin almost as tawny as a gypsy's, a hooked nose, black beetling brows, and eyes set so strangely in his head that they communicated a sinister expression to his countenance. He possessed a burly frame, square and somewhat heavy, though not so much as to impede his activity. In deportment and stature, though not in feature, he resembled the squire himself, and the likeness was heightened by his habiliments being part of Nicholas's old wardrobe, the doublet and hose, and even the green hat and boots, being those in which Nicholas made his first appearance in this history. The person who thus condescended to be fed and clothed at the squire's expense, and who filled a situation something between guest and menial without receiving the precise attention of the one or the wages of the other, but who made himself so useful to Nicholas that he could not dispense with him, neither, perhaps, would he have been shaken off, even if it had been desired, was named Lawrence Fogg, an entire stranger to the country, whom Nicholas had picked up at Colne, and whom he had invited to Downham for a few weeks' hunting, and had never been able to get rid of since. Lawrence Fogg liked his quarters immensely, and determined to remain in them, and, as a means to so desirable an end, he studied all the squire's weak points and peculiarities, and these not being very difficult to be understood, he soon mastered them, and mastered the squire into the bargain, but without allowing his success to become manifest. Nicholas was delighted to find one with tastes so congenial to his own, who was so willing to hunt or fish with him, who could train a hawk as well as Phil Royal the falconer, die at a fighting cock as well as Tom Shaw, the cockmaster, enter a hound, better than Charlie Crouch, the old huntsman, shoot with the longbow further than any one except himself, and was willing to toss off a pot with him, or sing a merry stave whenever he felt inclined. Such a companion was invaluable, and Nicholas congratulated himself upon the discovery, especially when he found Lawrence Fogg not unwilling to undertake some delicate commissions for him, which he could not well execute himself, and which he was unwilling should reach Mistress Asherton's ears. These were managed with equal adroitness and caution. About the same time, too, Nicholas, finding money scarce, and not liking to borrow it in person, delegated Fogg, and sent him round to his friends to ask for a loan. But in this instance the mission was attended with very indifferent success, for not one of them would lend him so small a sum as thirty pounds, all averring that they stood in need of it quite as much as himself. Though somewhat inconvenienced by their refusal, Nicholas bore the disappointment with his customary equanimity, and made merry with his friend as if nothing had happened. Fogg showed an equally accommodating spirit in all religious observances, and though much against his inclination, attended morning discourses and lectures with his patron, and even made an attempt at psalm-singing, but on one occasion, missing the tune, and coming in with a bacchanalian chorus, he was severely rebuked by the minister, and enjoined to keep silence in future. Such was the friendly relation subsisting between the parties, when they met together on the lawn on the morning in question. "'Well, Fogg,' cried Nicholas, after exchanging salutations with his friend, "'what say you to hunting the otter in the ribble after breakfast? "'Tis a rare day for the sport, and the hounds are in excellent order.' "'There's an old dam and a litter which we must kill, "'for she has been playing the very devil with the fish "'for a space of more than two mile. "'And if we let her off for another week, "'we shall have neither salmon, trout, nor umber, "'as all will have passed down the moors of her voracious brood.' "'And that would be a pity in good sooth, squire,' replied Fogg, "'for there are no fish like those of the ribble. "'Nothing I should prefer to the sport you promise. "'But I thought you had other business for me to-day.' "'Another attempt to borrow money, eh?' "'Ah, from my cousin Dick Asherton,' rejoined Nicholas. "'He'll lend me the thirty pound, I'm quite sure. "'But you had better defer the visit till to-morrow, "'when his father, Sir Richard, will be at Whaley, "'and when you can have him to yourself. "'Dick will not say you ne'er depend on it. "'He's too good a fellow for that. "'A moraine on those close-fisted curmudgeons, "'Roger Noel, Nicholas Townley, and Tom Whittaker.' 
They ought to be delighted to oblige me. Would they declare they have no money? said Fogg. No money? Phew! exclaimed Nicholas. An idle excuse. They've got chests full. Would I add all Roger Nowell's gold? I should not require another supply for years. But to death I will not trouble myself for a paltry thirty pound. If I might venture to suggest, Squire, while you are about it, I would ask for a hundred pound, or even two or three hundred, said Fogg. Your friends will think all the better of you, and feel more satisfied you intend to repay them. Do you think so? cried Nicholas. Then by Plutus it shall be three hundred pound, three hundred at interest. Dick will have to borrow the amount to lend it to me, but no matter, he'll easily obtain it. Knock your fog, while you're at Middleton, endeavour to ascertain whether anything has been arranged about the marriage of a certain young lady to a certain young gentleman. I'm curious to know the precise state of affairs in that quarter. I will arrive at the truth if possible, squire, replied Fogg. But I should scarcely think Sir Richard would assent to his son's union with the daughter of a notorious witch. Sir Richard's son is scarcely likely to ask Sir Richard's consent said Nicholas, and as to Mistress Nutter, though every charge has been brought against her, nothing's been proved, for you know she escaped, or rather was rescued, on her way to Lancaster Castle. "'I'm fully aware of it, Squire,' replied Fogg, "'and I more than suspect a worthy friend of mine had a hand in her deliverance, and could tell where to find her, if needful. But that's neither here nor there. The lady's quite innocent, I dare say.' "'Indeed, I'm quite sure of it, since you espouse her cause so warmly. "'But the world is malicious, and strange things are reported of her.' "'Heed not the world, Fogg,' rejoined Nicholas. "'The world speaks well of no man, be his deserts what they may. "'The world says that I waste my estate in wine, women, and horse-flesh, "'that I spend time in pleasures which might be profitably employed.' that I neglect my wife, forget my religious observances, I'm on horseback when I should be afoot, at the alehouse when I should be at home, and at a marriage when I should be at funeral, shooting when I should be keeping me books. In short, it has not a good word to say for me. And as for thee, Fogg, it says thou art an idle, good-for-nothing fellow. Or if thou art good for aught, it's only for something that leads to evil.' He says thou drinkest prodigiously, liest confoundedly, and swearest most profanely, and that thou art ever more ready to go to the alehouse and church, and that none of the girls can scape thee. Hey, the slanderers even go so far as to assert that thou would not hesitate to say, Stand and deliver, to a true man on the highway. That's what the world says of thee. Oh, but well, hang it, never look chapfallen, man. Let us go to the stables, and then we will into breakfast after which we will proceed to the Ribble, and spear the old otter. A fine old manorial residence was Downham, and beautifully situated, as has been shown, on a woody eminence to the north of Pendle Hill. It was of great antiquity, and first came into the possession of the Asherton family in 1558. Considerable additions had been made to it by its present owner, Nicholas, and the outlay necessarily required, combined with his lavish expenditure, had contributed to embarrass him. The stables were large and full of horses, the kennels on the same scale and equally well supplied with hounds, and there was a princely retinue of servants in the yard, grooms, keepers, falconers, huntsmen, and their assistants, to say nothing of their fellows within doors. In short, if it had been your fortune to accompany the squire and his friend round the premises, if you had walked through the stables and counted the horses, if you had viewed the kennels and examined the various hounds, the great Lancashire dogs, tall, shaggy, and heavy, a race now extinct, the Worcestershire hounds, then also in much repute, the greyhounds, the harriers, the beagles, the lurchers, and, lastly, the verminers, or, as we should call them, the terriers, if you had seen all these, you would not have wondered that money was scarce with him. Still further would your surprise at such a consequence have diminished if you had gone on to the falconry, and seen on the perches the goshawk and her tercel, the sparrowhawk and her musket, under the care of the ostriger, and further on the falcon gentle, the gerfalcon, the lanner, the merlin, and the hobby, all of which were attended to by a head falconer. It would have done you good to hear Nicholas inquiring from his men if they had set out their birds this morning and weathered them. 
if they had mummy powder in readiness, then esteemed a sovereign remedy. If the fures, hoods, jesses, buets, and all the other needful furniture were in good order, and if the meat were sweet and wholesome, you might next have followed him to the pens where the fighting cocks were kept, and where you would have found another source of expense in the cockmaster, Tom Shaw, a knave who not only got high wages from his master, but understood so well the dieting of his birds that he could make them win or lose a battle as he thought proper. Here again Nicholas had much to say, and was in raptures with one cock, which he told Fogg he would back to any amount, utterly unconscious of a significant look that passed between his friend and the cockmaster. "'Look at him!' cried the squire. "'How proud and erect he stands! His head is as small as that of a sparrowhawk, his eye large and quick, his body thick, his legs strong in the beam, and his spurs long, rough, and sharp. That's the bird for me. I will take him over to the cockpit at Prescott next week, and match him against any bird Sir John Talbot or my cousin Braddill can bring.' "'And yon win, squire,' replied the cockmaster. "'I've been feeding him these five weeks, and he be in rare condition then, and win a failure. You may lay what you like upon him,' he added, with a sly wink at Fogg. "'You may win the thirty pounds you want,' observed the latter, in a low tone to the squire. "'Or oh, mayhap lose it,' replied Nicholas. "'I shall not risk so much unless I get the three hundred from Dick Asherton. "'I've been unlucky of late. "'You beat me constantly at tables now, Fogg, "'and when I first knew you this was not wont to be the case. "'Nay, never make excuses, man. "'You cannot help it. "'Let's send to breakfast.' "'With this he proceeded towards the house, "'followed by Fogg and a couple of large Lancashire hounds, "'and entering at the back of the premises "'made his way through the scullery into the kitchen. Here there were plentiful evidences of the hospitality, not to say profusion, reigning throughout the mansion. An open door showed a larder stocked with all kinds of provisions, and before the fire joints of meat and poultry were roasting. Pies were baking in the oven, and over the flames in the chimney was suspended a black pot, large enough for a witch's cauldron. The cook was busied in preparing for the gridiron some freshly caught trout, intended for the squire's own breakfast and the kitchen-maid was toasting oat-cakes, of which there was a large supply in the bread-flake, depending from the ceiling. Casting a look round, and exchanging a few words with the cook, Nicholas moved on, still followed by Fogg and the hounds, and tracking along the stone passage, entered the great hall. Here the same disorder and irregularity prevailed as in his own character and conduct. All was litter and confusion— Around the walls were hung breastplates and buff coats, morions, shields, and two-handed swords, but they were half hidden by fishing-nets, fowling-nets, dogs' collars, saddles and bridles, housing, crossbows, longbows, quivers, baldricks, horns, spears, guns, and every other implement then used in the sports of the river or the field. The floor was in an equal state of disorder. The rushes were filled with half-gnawed bones, brought thither by the hounds, and in one corner, on a mat, was a favourite spaniel and her whelps. The squire, however, was happily insensible to the condition of the chamber, and looked around it with an air of satisfaction, as if he thought it the perfection of comfort. A table was spread for breakfast, near a window looking out upon the lawn, and two covers only were laid, for Mistress Nicholas Ashton did not make her appearance at this early hour and now was exhibited one of those strange contradictions of which the squire's character was composed. Kneeling down by the side of the table, and without noticing the mocking expression of Fogg's countenance as he followed his example, Nicholas prayed, loudly and fervently, for upwards of ten minutes, after which he arose and gave a shout which proved that his lungs were unimpaired, and not only roused the whole house, but set all the dogs barking. Presently, a couple of serving-men answered this lusty summons, and the table was covered with good and substantial dishes, which he and his companion attacked with a vigour such as only the most valiant trencherman can display. Already has it been remarked that a breakfast at the period in question resembled a modern dinner, and better proof could not have been afforded of the correctness of the description than the meal under discussion— which comprised fish, flesh, and fowl, boiled, broiled, and roast, together with strong ale and sack. After an hour thus agreeably employed, and while they were still seated, 
though breakfast had pretty nearly come to an end, a serving-man entered, announcing Master Richard Sherborne of Dunmow. The squire instantly sprang to his feet, and hastened to welcome his brother-in-law. "'Ah, good day to you, Dick!' he cried, shaking him heartily by the hand. "'But what happy child brings you here so early? But first sit down and eat. Eat and talk afterwards. Here, Roger. Harry, bring another platter and napkin, and let us have more broiled trout and a cold capon, a pasty, or whatever you can find in the larder. Try some of this gammon, meanwhile, Dick. It'll help down a can of ale. And now what brings thee hither, lad? Blessing business, no doubt. Thou may speak before Fogg. I have no secrets from him. He's my second self.' "'I have no secrets to divulge, Nicholas,' replied Sherborne, "'and I will tell you at once what I am come about. "'Have you heard that the king is about to visit Houghton Tower in August?' "'No, this is news to me,' replied Nicholas. "'Does your business relate to his visit?' "'It does,' replied Sherborne. "'Last night a messenger came to me from Sir Richard Houghton, entreating me to move you to do him the favour and courtesy to attend him at the king's coming, and wear his livery. Ah, "'I wear his livery!' exclaimed Nicholas indignantly. "'Steth, what do you take me for, cousin Dick?' "'For a right good fellow, who I am sure will comply with his friend's request, especially when he finds there's no sort of degradation in it,' replied Sherborne. "'Why, I shall wear Sir Richard's cloth, and so will several others of our friends.' "'There will be rare doings at Houghton, "'maskings, mummings, and all sorts of revels, "'besides hunting, shooting, racing, resting, "'and the devil knows what. "'You may feast and carouse to your heart's content. "'The Dukes of Buckingham and Richmond will be there, "'and the Earls of Nottingham and Pembroke, "'and Sir Gilbert Houghton, "'the King's great favourite who married the Duchess of Buckingham's sister. "'Besides these you will have all the beauty of Lancashire, "'I would not miss the sight for thirty pounds.' Thirty pounds?' echoed Nicholas, as if struck with a sudden thought. "'Do you think Sir Thomas Houghton would lend me that sum "'if I consent to wear his cloth and attend him?' "'I have no doubt of it,' replied Sherborne. "'And if he won't, I will.' "'Then I'll put my pride in my pocket and go,' said Nicholas. "'And now, Dick, dispatch your breakfast as quickly as you can, "'and then I'll take you to the Ribble and show you some sport with an otter.' Sherborne was not long in concluding his repast, "'and having received an otter-spear from the squire, "'who had already provided himself and Fogg with like weapons, "'all three adjourned to the kennels, "'where they found the old huntsman, Charlie Crouch, awaiting them, "'attended by four stout varlets, armed with forked staves, meant for the double purpose of beating the river's banks and striking the poor beast they were about to hunt, and each man having a couple of hounds well entered for the chase in leash. Old Crouch was a thin, grey-bearded fellow, but possessed of a tough, muscular frame, which served him quite as well in the long run as the younger and apparently more vigorous limbs of his assistants. His cheek was hale, and his eye still bright and quick, and a certain fierceness was imparted to his countenance by a large aquiline nose. He was attired in a greasy leathern jerkin, tight hose of the same material, and had a bugle suspended from his neck, and a sharp hunting-knife thrust into his girdle. In his hand he bore a spear like his master, and was followed by a grey old lurcher, who, though wanting an ear and an eye, and disfigured by sundry scars on throat and back, was hardy, untiring, and sagacious. This ancient dog was called Grip, from his tenacity in holding anything he set his teeth upon, and he and Crouch were inseparable. Great was the clamour occasioned by the squire's appearance in the yard. The coupled hounds gave tongue at once, and sang out most melodiously, and all the other dogs within the kennels, or roaming at will about the yard, joined the concert. After much swearing, cracking of whips, and yelping consequent upon the cracking, Silence was in some degree restored, and a consultation was then held between Nicholas and Crouch as to where their steps should first be bent. The old huntsman was for drawing the river near a place called Beanhill Wood, as the trees thereabouts, growing close to the water's edge, it was pretty certain that the otter would have her couch amid the roots of some of them. This was objected to by one of the varlets, who declared that the beast lodged in a hollow tree— 
standing on a bank nearly a mile higher up the stream, and close by the point of junction between Swanside Beck and the Ribble. He was certain of the fact, he avouched, because he had noticed her marks on the moist grass near the tree. "'The goes there to fish, mon cried Crouch. "'For it's the nature of the wary varmint to feed at a distance for her lodging. "'But I'm sure wishing later on her among the roots of them big trees "'or hanging the river near Bean Hill Wood. "'And if the squire take my advice, he'll go there first. "'I put myself entirely under your guidance, Crouch.' said Nicholas. "'And you'll be all right, sir,' replied the huntsman. "'When beat the bunks well, and two of these chaps shall go up the stream, and two down, one on one side, and one on t'other, and in that manner cannot escape us. For Grip can swim and dive as well as any otter I in all Englandshire, and he'll be after her and her litter the moment they take the water.' Some folk, as may be on scene, squire, take hold on a cord by both ends, and drop it in into the river, throw it slowly along, so they can tell by the jerk when Dotter touches it. But this is an uncertain method, and is not like Grip's plan. For ever wherever you see him swimming, t'other beast, you may be sure, is nae far ahead. A ah, brave dog, but confoundedly ugly, exclaimed the squire regarding the old one-eared, one-eyed lurcher with mingled admiration and disgust. "'And now that's all arranged, let's be off.' Accordingly they quitted the courtyard, and, shaping their course in the direction indicated by the huntsman, entered the park, and proceeded along a glade, chequered by the early sunbeams. Here the noise they made in their progress speedily disturbed a herd of deer browsing beneath the trees, and as the dappled foresters darted off to a thicker covet, great difficulty was experienced by the varlets in restraining the hounds, who struggled eagerly to follow them, and made the welkin resound with their baying. "'Yonder's a tall feller," cried Nicholas, pointing out a noble buck to Crouch. "'I must kill him next week, for I want to send a haunch of venison to Middleton, and another to Whaley Abbey for Sir Ralph.' "'Better hunt him, squire,' said Crouch. "'He'll give you good sport.' Soon after this they attained an eminence, where a charming sweep of country opened upon them, including the finest part of Ribblesdale, with its richly wooded plains, and the swift and beautiful river from which it derived its name. The view was enchanting, and the squire and his companions paused for a moment to contemplate it, and then, stepping gleefully forward, made their way over the elastic turf towards a small thicket skirting the park. All were in high spirits, for the freshness and beauty of the morning had not been without effect, and the squire's tongue kept pace with his legs as he strode briskly along. But as they entered the thicket in question, and caught sight of the river through the trees, the old huntsman enjoined silence, and he was obliged to put a check upon his loquacity. When within a bow-shot from the water, the party came to a halt, and two of the men were directed by Crouch to cross the stream at different points, and then commence beating the banks, while the other two were ordered to pursue a like course, but to keep on the near side of the river. The hounds were next uncoupled, and the men set off to execute the orders they had received, and soon afterwards the crashing of branches and the splashing of water, accompanied by the deep baying of the hounds, told they were at work. Meanwhile, Nicholas and the others had not remained idle. As the varlets struck off in different directions, they went straight on, and forcing their way through the brushwood, came to a high bank overlooking the ribble, on the top of which grew three or four large trees, whose roots, laid bare on the further side by the swollen currents of winter, formed a convenient resting-place for the fish-loving creature they hoped to surprise. Receiving a hint from Crouch to make for the central tree, Nicholas grasped his spear and sprang forward. But quick as he was, he was too late, though he saw enough to convince him that the crafty old huntsman had been correct in his judgment, for a dark, slimy object dropped from out the roots of the tree beneath him, and glided into the water as swiftly and as noiselessly as if its skin had been oiled. A few bubbles rose to the surface of the water, but these were all the indications marking the course of the wondrous diver. But other eyes, sharper than those of Nicholas, were on the watch, and the old huntsman shouted out, 
There a goes, Grip. After her, lad, after her. The words were scarcely uttered when the dog sprang from the top of the bank and sank under the water. For some seconds no trace could be observed of either animal, and then the shaggy nose of the lurcher was seen nearly fifty yards higher up the river, and after sniffing around for a moment, and fixing his single eye on his master, who was standing on the bank and encouraging him with his voice and gesture, he dived again. "'Station yourselves on the bank, fifty paces apart,' cried Crouch. "'Run, run, or you'll be too late, and strike as quick as eat if you've a chance. Say where you are, squire,' he added to Nicholas. "'You cannot be better placed.' All was now animation and excitement. Perceiving from the noise that the otter had been found, the four varlets hastened towards the scene of action, and by their shouts and the clatter of their staves contributed greatly to its spirit. Two were on one side of the stream, and two on the other, and up to this moment the hounds were similarly separated. But now most of them had taken to the water, some swimming about, others standing up to the middle in the shallower part of the current, watching with keen gaze for the appearance of their anticipated victim. Having descended the bank, Nicholas had so placed himself among the twisted roots of the tree, that if the otter, alarmed by the presence of so many foes, and unable to escape either up or down the river, should return to her couch, he made certain of striking her. At first there seemed little chance of such an occurrence, for Fogg, who had gone a hundred yards higher up, suddenly dashed into the stream, and plunging his spear into the mud, cried out that he had hit the beast but the next moment, when he drew the weapon forth, and exhibited a large rat which he had transfixed, his mistake excited much merriment. Old Crouch, meantime, did not suffer his attention to be drawn from his dog. Every now and then he saw him come to the surface to breathe, but as he kept within a short distance, though rising at different points, the old huntsman felt certain the otter had not got away, and having the utmost reliance upon Grip's perseverance and sagacity, he felt confident he would bring the quarry to him if the thing were possible. The varlets kept up an incessant clatter, beating the water with their staves and casting large stones into it, while the hounds bayed furiously, so that the poor fugitive was turned on whichever side she attempted a retreat. While this was going on, Nicholas was cautioned by the huntsman to look out, and scarcely had the admonition reached him than the sleek, shining body of the otter emerged from the water and wreathed itself among the roots. The squire instantly dealt a blow, which he expected to prove fatal, but his mortification was excessive when he found he had driven his spearhead so deeply into the tree that he could scarcely disengage it, while an almost noiseless plunge told that his prey had escaped. Almost at the same moment that the poor hunted beast had sought its old lodging, the untiring lurcher had appeared at the edge of the bank, and as the former again went down, he dived likewise. Secretly laughing at the squire's failure, the old huntsman prepared to take advantage of a similar opportunity, if it should present itself, and with this view ensconced himself behind a pollard willow, which stood close beside the stream, whence he could watch closely all that passed, without being exposed to view. The prudence of the step was soon manifest. After the lapse of a few seconds, during which neither dog nor otter had risen to breathe, a slight, very slight undulation was perceptible on the surface of the water. Crouch's grasp tightened upon his staff. He waited another moment, then dashed forward, struck down his spear, and raised it aloft, with the poor otter transfixed and writhing upon its point. Loudly and exultingly did the old man shout at his triumph, and loudly were his vociferations answered by the others. All flew to the spot where he was standing, and the hounds, gathering around him, yelled furiously at the otter, and showed every disposition to tear her in pieces if they could get at her. Kicking the noisiest and fiercest of them out of the way, Crouch approached the river's bank, and lowered the spearhead till it came within reach of his favourite grip, who had not yet come out of the water, but stood within his depth, with his one red eye fixed on the enemy he had so hotly pursued, and fully expecting his reward. It now came. His sharp teeth instantly met in the otter's throat, 
and when Crouch swung them both in the air he still maintained his hold, showing how well he deserved his name. Nor could he be disengaged until long after the sufferings of the tortured animal had ceased. To say that Nicholas was neither chagrined at his ill success nor jealous of the old huntsman's superior skill would be to affirm an untruth. But he put the best face he could upon the matter, and praised Grip very highly, alleging that the whole merit of the hunt rested with him. Old Crouch let him go on, and when he had done, quietly observed that the otter they had destroyed was not the one they had come in search of, as they had seen nothing of her litter, and that most likely the beast that had done so much mischief had her lodging in the hollow tree near the swan-side beck, as described by the varlet, and he wanted to know whether the squire would like to go and hunt her. Nicholas replied that he was quite willing to do so, and hoped he should have better luck on the second occasion. And with this they set forward again, taking their way along the side of the stream, beating the banks as they went, but without rousing anything beyond an occasional water-rat, which was killed almost as soon as found by Grip. Somehow or other, without any one being aware what led to it, the conversation fell upon the two old witches, Mothers Demdike and Chattox, and the strange manner in which their career had terminated on the summit of Pendle Hill, if indeed it could be said to have terminated when their spirits were reported to haunt the spot, and might be seen, it was asserted, at midnight flitting round the beacon and shrieking dismally. The restless shades were pursued, it was added, by the figure of a monk in white mouldering robes, supposed to be the ghost of Paslew. It was difficult to understand how these apparitions could be witnessed, since no one, even for a reward, could be prevailed upon to ascend Pendle Hill after nightfall. But the shepherds affirmed that they had seen them from below, and that was testimony sufficient to shake the most sceptical. One singular circumstance was mentioned, which must not be passed by without notice, and this was that when the cinders of the extinct beacon fire came to be examined, no remains whatever of the two hags could be discovered, though the ashes were carefully sifted, and it was quite certain that the flames had expired long before their bodies could be consumed. The explanation attempted for this marvel was that Satan had carried them off while yet living, to finish their combustion in a still more fiery region. Mention of Mother Demdike naturally led to her grandson, Jem Device, who, having escaped in a remarkable manner on the night in question, notwithstanding the hue and cry made after him, had not, as yet, been captured, though he had been occasionally seen at night, and under peculiar circumstances by various individuals, and amongst others by old Crouch, who, however, declared that he had been unable to lay hands upon him. Allusion was then made to Mistress Nutter, whereupon it was observed that the squire had changed the conversation quickly, while sundry sly winks and shrugs were exchanged among the varlets of the kennel, seemingly to intimate that they knew more about the matter than they cared to admit. Nothing more, however, was elicited than that the escort conducting her to Lancaster Castle together with the other witches, after their examination before the magistrates at Whaley and Committal, had been attacked, while it was passing through a woody defile in Boland Forest, by a party of men in the garb of foresters, and the lady set free. Nor had she been heard of since. What made this rescue the more extraordinary was that none of the other witches were liberated at the same time, but some of them, who seemed disposed to take advantage of the favourable interposition, and endeavoured to get away, were brought back by the foresters to the offices of justice, thus clearly proving that the attempt was solely made on Mistress Nutter's account, and must have been undertaken by her friends. Nothing, it was asserted, could equal the rage and mortification of Roger Nowell and Potts on learning that their chief prey had thus escaped them, and by their directions for more than a week the strictest search was made for the fugitive throughout the neighbourhood, but without effect. No clue could be discovered to her retreat. Suspicion naturally fell upon the two Ashertons, Nicholas and Richard, and Roger Nowell roundly taxed them with contriving and executing the enterprise in person, while Potts told them they were guilty of misprison of felony, and threatening them with imprisonment for life, forfeiture of goods and of rents for the offence 
but as the charge could not be proved against them, notwithstanding all the efforts of the magistrate and attorney, it fell to the ground, and Master Potts, full of chagrin at this unexpected and vexatious termination of the affair, returned to London, and settled himself in his chambers in Chancery Lane. His duties, however, as clerk of the court, would necessarily call him to Lancaster in August, when the assizes commenced, and when he would assist in the trials of such of the witches as were still in durance. From Mother Demdike it was natural that the conversation should turn to her weird retreat, Malkin Tower, and Richard Sherborne ex expressed his surprise that the unhallowed structure should be suffered to remain standing after her removal. Nicholas said he was equally anxious with his brother-in-law for its demolition, but it was not so easy to be accomplished as it might appear, for the deserted structure was in such ill repute with the common folk, as well as every one else, that no one dared approach it, even in the daytime. A boggart, it was said, had taken possession of its vaults, and scared away all who ventured near it, sometimes showing himself in one frightful shape, and sometimes in another, now as a monstrous goat, now as an equally monstrous cat, uttering fearful cries, glaring with fiery eyes from out the windows, or appearing in all his terror on the summit of the tower. Moreover, the haunted structure was frequently lighted up at dead of night. Strains of unearthly music were heard resounding from it, and wild figures were seen flitting past the windows, as if engaged in dancing and revelry so that it appeared that no alteration for the better had taken place there, and that things were still quite as improperly conducted now as they had been in the time of Mother Demdike, or in those of her predecessors, Isolde Heaton and Blackburn the robber. The common opinion was that Satan, with all his imps, had taken up their abode in the tower, and as they liked their quarters, they led a jolly life there, dancing and drinking all night long, it would be useless at present to give them notice to quit, still less to attempt to pull down the house about their ears. Richard Sherborne heard this wondrous relation in silence, but with a look of incredulity, and when it was done he winked slyly at his brother-in-law. A strange expression, half comical, half suspicious, might also have been observed on Fogg's countenance, and he narrowly watched the squire as the latter spoke. But with the disappearance of the malignant old hags who had so long infested the neighbourhood, had all the mischief and calamity ceased? Or were the people as much affected as heretofore? Were there, in short, so many cases of witchcraft, real or supposed? This was the question, next addressed by Sherborne to Nicholas. The squire answered decidedly that there was not. Since the burning of the two old beldames, and the imprisonment of the others, the whole district of Pendle had improved. All those who had been smitten with strange illnesses had recovered, and the inhabitants of the little village of Sabden, who had experienced the fullest effects of their malignity, were entirely free from sickness. And not only had they and their families suddenly regained health and strength, but all belonging to them had undergone a similar beneficial change. The kine that had lost their milk now yielded it abundantly. The lame horse halted no longer. The murrain ceased among the sheep. The pigs that had grown lean amidst abundance fattened rapidly. And though the pharaohs that had perished during the evil ascendancy of the witches could not be brought back again, their place promised speedily to be supplied by others. The corn blighted earlier in the year had sprung forth anew, and the trees nipped in the bud were laden with fruit. In short, all was as fair and as flourishing as it had recently been the reverse. Among others, John Law, the peddler, who had been deprived of the use of his limbs by the damnable arts of Mother Demdike, had marvellously recovered on the very night of her destruction, and was now as strong and as active as ever. "'Such happy results having followed the removal of the witches, it is to be hoped,' Sherborne said, that the redance would be complete, and that none of the obnoxious brood would be left to inflict future miseries upon their fellows. This could not be the case so long as James Device was allowed to go at large, nor while his mother, Elizabeth Device, a notorious witch, was suffered to escape with impunity. There was also Janet, Elizabeth's daughter, a mischievous and ill-favoured little creature, who inherited all the ill qualities of her parents. 
These were spawn of the old snake, and until they were entirely exterminated, there could be no security against the recurrence of the evil. Again there was Nance Redfern, old Chattox's granddaughter, a comely woman enough, but a reputed witch, and an undoubted fabricator of clay images. She was still at liberty, though she ought to be with the rest in the dungeons of Lancaster Castle. It was useless to allege that with the destruction of the old hags all danger had ceased. Common prudence would keep the others quiet now, but the moment the storm had passed over they would resume their atrocious practices, and all would be as bad as ever. No, no, the tree must be utterly uprooted, or it would inevitably burst forth anew. With these opinions Nicholas generally concurred, but he expressed some sympathy for Nance Redfern, whom he thought far too good-looking to be as wicked and malicious as represented. But however that might be, and however much he might desire to get rid of the family of the devices, he feared such a step might be attended with danger to Alison, and that she might in some way be implicated with them. This last remark he addressed in an undertone to his brother-in-law. Sherborne did not at first feel any apprehension on that score, but on reflection he admitted that Nicholas was perhaps right. And though Alison was now the recognised daughter of Mistress Nutter, yet her long and intimate connection with the Device family might operate to her prejudice, while her near relationship to an avowed witch would not tend to remove the unfavourable impression. Sherborne then went on to speak in the most rapturous forms of the beauty and goodness of the young girl, who formed the subject of their conversation, and declared he was not in the least surprised that Richard Asherton was so much in love with her. And yet, he added, a most extraordinary change had taken place in her since the dreadful night on Pendle Hill, when her mother's guilt had been proclaimed, and when her arrest had taken place as an offender of the darkest dye. Alison, he said, had lost none of her beauty, but her light and joyous expression of countenance had been supplanted by a look of profound sadness, which nothing could remove. Gentle and meek in her deportment, she seemed to look upon herself as under a ban, and as if she were unfit to associate with the rest of the world. In vain Richard Asherton and his sister endeavoured to remove this impression by the tenderest assiduities. In vain they sought to induce her to enter into amusements consistent with her years. She declined all society but their own, and passed the greater part of her time in prayer. Sherborne had seen her so engaged, and the expression of her countenance, he declared, was seraphic. On the extreme verge of a high bank situated at the point of junction between Swansea Beck and the Ribble stood an old decayed oak. Little of the once mighty tree beyond the gnarled trunk was left, and this was completely hollow, while there was a great rift near the bottom through which a man might easily creep, and when once in, stand erect without inconvenience. Beneath the bank the river was deep and still, forming a pool where the largest and fattest fish were to be met with. In addition to this, the spot was extremely secluded, being rarely visited by the angler on account of the thick copse by which it was surrounded, and which extended along the back, from the point of view of confluence between the lesser and the larger stream, to Downham Mill, nearly half a mile distant. The sides of the Ribble were here as elsewhere beautifully wooded, and as the clear stream winded along through banks of every diversity of shape and character, and covered by forest trees of every description, and of the most luxuriant growth, the effect was enchanting, the more so that the sun, having now risen high in the heavens, poured down a flood of summer heat and radiance that rendered these cool shades inexpressibly delightful. Pleasant was it, as the huntsman leapt from stone to stone, to listen to the sound of the waters rushing past them. Pleasant, as they sprang upon some green home or fairy islet standing in the midst of the stream, and dividing its lucid waters, to suffer the eye to follow the course of the rapid current, and to see it here sparkling in the bright sunshine, there, plunged in shade by the overhanging trees, now fringed with osiers and rushes, now embanked by the smoothest sward of emerald green, anon defended by steep rocks, sometimes bold and bare, but more frequently clothed with timber. 
and then sinking down by one of those sudden but exquisite transitions which nature alone dares display from this savage and sombre character into the softest and gentlest expression, everywhere varied, yet everywhere beautiful. Through such scenes of sylvan loveliness had the huntsmen passed on their way to the hollow oak, and they had ample leisure to enjoy them, because the squire and his brother-in-law, being engaged in conversation, as before related, made frequent pauses, and during these the others halted likewise, and even the hounds, glad of a respite, stood still, or amused themselves by splashing them out amid the shallows, without any definite object, unless of cooling themselves. Then, as the leaders once more moved forward, arose the cheering shout, the loud deep bay, the clattering of staves, the crashing of branches, and all the other inspiriting noises accompanying the progress of the hunt. But for some minutes these had again ceased, and as Nicholas and Sherborne lingered beneath the shade of a widespread beech-tree growing on a sandy hillock near the stream, and seemed deeply interested in their talk, as well they might, for it related to Alison, the whole troop, including Fogg, held respectfully aloof, and awaited their pleasure to go on. The signal to move was at length given by the squire, who saw they were now not more than a hundred yards from the bank on which stood the hollow tree they were anxious to reach. As the river here made a turn, and swept round the point in question, forming, owing to this detention, the deep pool previously mentioned, the bank almost facing them, and as nothing intervened, they could almost look into the rift near the base of the tree, forming, they supposed, the entrance to the otter's couch. But though this was easily distinguished, no traces of the predatory animal could be seen, and though many sharp eyes were fixed on the spot during the prolonged discourse of the two gentlemen, nothing had occurred to attract their attention, and to prove that the object of their quest was really there. After some little consultation between the squire and Crouch, it was agreed that the former should alone force his way to the tree, while the others were to station themselves with the hounds at various points of the stream above and below the bank, so that if the otter and her litter escaped their first assailant, they should infallibly perish by the hands of some of the others. This being agreed upon, the plan was instantly put into execution, two of the varlets remaining where they were, two going higher up, while Sherborne and Fogg stationed themselves on great stones in the middle of the stream, whence they could command all around them, and Crouch, wading on with grip, planted himself at the entrance of Swanside Beck into the Ribble. Meanwhile, the squire, having scaled the bank, entered the thick covert encircling it, and, not without some damage to his face and hands from the numerous thorns and brambles growing amongst it, forced his way upwards until he reached the bare space surrounding the hollow tree, and this attained, his first business was to ascertain that all was in readiness below before commencing the attack. A glance showed him, on one side, old Crouch, standing up to his middle in the beck, grasping his long otter-spear, and with grip beating the water in front of him in anxious expectation of employment, and in front Fogg, Sherborne, and two of the varlets, with their hounds so dispersed that they could immediately advance upon the otter if it plunged into the river, while its passage up or down would be stopped by their comrades. All this he discerned at a glance, and comprehending from a sign made him by the old huntsman that he should not delay, he advanced towards the tree, and was about to plunge his spear into the hole, hoping to transfix one at least of its occupants, when he was startled by hearing a deep voice apparently issue from the hollows of the timber, bidding him, "'Beware!' Nicholas recoiled aghast, for he thought it might be Hobhurst or the demon of the wood who thus bespoke him. "'What a cursed thing addresses me!' he said, standing on his guard. "'What is it? Speak!' "'Get hence, Nicholas Asherton,' replied the voice, "'and meddle not with them as meddles not with they.' "'Ah, ah!' exclaimed the squire, recovering courage, for he thought this did not sound like the language of a demon. "'Ah, no, am I. Why should I go hence, and at whose bidding?' "'Ask no questions, mon, but go,' replied the voice. "'Or oh, it should be the worse for thee. I am the boggart of the clough, and if thou bring'st me out, I'll tear thee in pieces with my claws, and cast thee into the ribble, so that thine own hounds shall eat thee up.' 
"'Here, yeah, slayest thou so, Master Boggart?' cried Nicholas. "'For a spirit thou usest the vernacular of the county fairly enough, but before trying whether thy hide be proof against mortal weapons, I command thee to come forth and declare thyself, that I may judge what manner of thing thou art.' "'Thou'dst best let me be, I tell thee,' replied the Boggart gruffly. "'Aha! Methinks I know those accents,' exclaimed the squire. "'They marvellously resemble the voice of an offender who has too long evaded justice, and whom I have now fairly entrapped. Jem Device, thou art known, lad, and if thou dost not surrender at discretion, I will strike my spear through this rotten tree, and spit thee as I would the beast I came in quest of.' "'Of which you would more easily than me,' retorted Jem, and suddenly springing from the hole at the foot of the tree, he passed between the squire's legs with great promptitude, and flinging him face foremost on the ground, crawled to the edge of the bank, and thence dropped into the deep pool below. The plunge roused all the spectators, who, though they had heard what had passed, and seen the squire upset in the manner described, they had been so much astounded that they could render no assistance. But they now, one and all, bestirred themselves actively to seize the diver when he should rise to the surface. But though every eye was on the lookout, and every arm raised, though the hounds were as eager as their masters, and, yelling fiercely, swam round the pool, ready to pounce upon the swimmer as upon a duck, all were disappointed, for even after a longer interval than their patience could brook, he did not appear. By this time Nicholas had regained his legs, and, infuriated by his discomfiture, approached the edge of the bank, and, peering down below, hoped to detect the fugitive immediately beneath him, resolved to show him no mercy when he caught him. But he was equally at fault with the others, and after more than five minutes spent in ineffectual search, he ordered Crouch to send Grip into the pool. The old keeper replied that the dog was not used to this kind of chase, and might not display his usual skin in it. But as the squire would take no nay, he was obliged to consent, and the otter-hounds were called off lest they should puzzle him. Twice did the shrewd lurcher swim round the pool, sniffing the air, after which he approached the shore, and sent it close to the bank. But still it was evident that he could detect nothing, and Nicholas began to despair when the dog suddenly dived. Expectation was then raised to the utmost, and all were on the watch again. Nicholas, leaning over the edge of the bank, with his spear in his hand, prepared to strike, but the dog was so long in reappearing that all had given him up for lost, and his master was giving utterance to ejaculations of grief and rage, and vowing vengeance against the warlock, when Grip's grisly head was once more seen above the surface of the water, and this time he had a piece of blue surge in his jaws, proving that he had hold of the raiment of the fugitive, and therefore the latter could not be far off, but had most probably got into some hole beneath the bank. No sooner was this notion suggested than it was acted on by the old huntsman and fog, and wading forward they pricked the bank with their spears at various points below the level of the water. All at once fog fell forward, his spear had entered a hole, and had penetrated so deeply that he had lost his balance. But though soused over head and ears, he had made a successful hit, for the next moment Jem Device appeared above the water, and ere he could dive again, his throat was seized by grip, and while struggling to free himself from the fangs of the tenacious animal, he was laid hold of by Crouch, and the varlets rushing forward to the latter's assistance, the ruffian was captured." Some difficulty was experienced in rescuing the captive from the jaws of the hounds, who, infuriated by his struggles, and perhaps mistaking him for some strange beast of chase, made their sharp teeth meet in various parts of his person, rending his garments from his limbs, and would no doubt have rent the flesh also if they had been permitted. At length, after much fighting and struggling, mingled with yells and vociferations, Jem was borne ashore, and flung on the ground, where he presented a wretched spectacle, bleeding, half-drowned, and covered with slime, acquired during his occupation of the hole in the bank. But though unable to offer further resistance, his spirit was not quelled, and his eye glared terribly at his captors. Fearing they might have further trouble with him when he recovered from his present exhausted condition, 
Crouch had his hands bound tightly together with one of the dog-leashes, and then would fain have questioned him as to how he managed to breathe in a hole below the level of the water, but Jem refused to satisfy his curiosity, and returned only a sullen rejoinder to any questions addressed to him, until the squire, who had crossed the river at some stepping-stones lower down, came up, and the ruffian then inquired in a half-menacing tone what he meant to do with him. "'What do I mean to do with you?' cried Nicholas. "'I'll tell you, lad. I shall send you at once to Whaley to be examined before the magistrates, and as the proofs are pretty clear against you, you'll be forward without any material delay to Lancaster Castle. And I will rescue me by the way, as you have done a certain notorious witch and murderess.' "'replied Jem fiercely. "'Take heed what you've done, squire. "'If I speak at all, I shan't speak out, "'and to some purpose I'd warrant you. "'If I go to Lancaster Castle, I wanna go alone. "'One of your friends shall go with me.' "'Cursed villain, I guess thy meaning,' replied Nicholas. "'But thy vindictive purposes will be frustrated. "'No credence will be attached to thy false charges.' "'Well, as to the lady thou aimest at, she is luckily beyond reach of thy malice.' "'Don't it be too sure of that, squire,' replied Jem. "'I can put the officers of justice as surely on her track as old Crouch could set these hounds on the knotter. Lay her account on it, and win her die unavenged.' "'He him not,' interposed Sherborne, seeing that the squire was shaken by his threat, and taking him apart. "'It will not do to let such a villain escape. "'He can do you no injury, and as to Mr. Nutter, "'if you know where she is, it will be easy to give her a hint to get out of the way.' Uh, "'I don't know that,' replied Nicholas, thoughtfully. "'If I might be so bold as to offer my advice, squire,' said old Crouch, "'advancing towards his master, "'I'd tear every stone round the fellow's throttle and chuck him in.' Pole, and he'll tell no tales for all his bragging. <laughs> that would silence him effectually, no doubt, Crouch, replied Nicholas, laughing. But a dog's death is too good for him. Besides, I'm pretty sure his destiny is not drowning. No, no, at all risks he shall go to Whaley. Harky Fogg, he added, beckoning that worthy to him, I commit the conduct and custody of the prisoner to you. Clap him on a horse. "'Get on another yourself. Take these four violets with you, and deliver him into the hands of Sir Ralph Asherton, who will relieve you of all further trouble and responsibility. But you may add this to the baronet from me,' he continued in an undertone. "'I recommend him to place under immediate arrest Elizabeth Device, the prisoner's mother, and her daughter Janet. You understand, Fogg, eh?' Perfectly, returned the other, with a somewhat singular look. "'In your instructions shall be fulfilled to the letter. "'Have you anything more to commit to me?' "'Only this,' said Nicholas. "'You may tell Sir Ralph that I propose to sleep at the Abbey to-night. "'I shall ride over to Middleton in the course of the day "'to confer with Dick Asherton upon what has just occurred, "'and get the money from him, the three hundred pounds, you understand. And "'When my errand is done, I'll turn bridle towards Whaley. "'I shall return by Todmorden and through the gorge of Clevager. "'You may as well tarry for me at the Abbey, "'for Sir Ralph will be glad of thy company, "'and we can return together to Down and to-morrow.' "'As the squire thus spoke, "'he noticed a singular sparkle in Fogg's ill-set eyes, "'but he thought nothing of it at the time, "'though it subsequently occurred to his recollection. "'Meanwhile the prisoner, finding no grace likely to be shown him, "'shouted out to the squire that if he were set free— he would make certain important disclosures to him respecting Fogg, who was not what he represented himself. But Nicholas treated the offer with disdain, and the individual mainly interested in the matter, who appeared highly incensed by Jem's malignity, cut a short peg by way of a gag, and thrusting it into the ruffian's mouth, effectively checked any more revelations on his part. Fogg then ordered the varlets to bring on the prisoner, but as Jem obstinately refused to move, they were under the necessity of taking him on their shoulders, and transporting him in this manner to the stables, where he was placed on a horse, as directed by the squire. End of chapter 1